everybody. Welcome back to Six Degrees of Associations. I am super excited to be hosting this episode. I am your podcast producer slash host for today's episode. I am Casey Callanan, and I have the great pleasure of interviewing Jennifer Regala today. She's the director of publications and the executive editor with the American Urological Association. That's Urology with a U, located outside of Baltimore. We were colleagues, so I'm super excited to catch up with Jennifer today as I am a former employee of AUA and I I love that association. I think whenever you're talking about associations and professional development in this space, no one does it better than the AUA and I am so excited to talk to Jennifer. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Just tell us a little bit about your professional background before the AUA and what you do now. Sure. Thank you. And thank you. It's so nice to see you, Casey. I loved working with you and I love keeping in touch now. So we haven't really skipped a beat. Um, so I can't wait to get into that, you know, discussion as well. So I, um, graduated from the University of Maryland way back further than I care to admit. But my original career intent was to, I was a journalism major and my original career intent was to be the next Katie Couric on the Today Show. Um, as you can see, it did not exactly pan out. But that's okay. It's okay. Um, I am here where I am, and I love everything about what I do. But what happened between point A and point AUA, um, that is an interesting tale. I did actually work um, just out of college um, at the Maryland House of Delegates, um, but the House of Delegates in our state um, is only in session for three months of the year. So I graduated in December. It was a perfect, just get out of college job, get some experience, but the legislative session ended in April and then the job was going to become part-time. So it was time for me to get a little bit serious and get a quote, real full-time job. Um, from there. So I accidentally found myself at a different association. It was called the Fertilizer Institute in Washington, D.C. And I wore many hats at that organization. Um, I started, I, you know what, honestly, I can't remember what my title was, but we didn't have a computer network. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have email. Oh my gosh. So this, this has been a while. Um, so one of the things I'm, I said, you know, there's this thing called the internet and also maybe we should all have email here. And they're like, well, we're a pretty small organization. Uh, we had fewer than 30 people. They said, why don't you investigate that for us? Why don't you, um, look at that? Um, so I did and we ended up, um, you know, getting a computer network. We ended up getting email, the whole nine yards. My title on accident by the time I left that organization was manager of information services, um, which that was not my background, but it really taught me a lot. Um, it taught me to kind of make it up as I go along, um, fake it till you make it, um, do your research, find good people to surround you. And also it taught me about good leadership too, because my organization's like, we have no idea what you're talking about, but it sounds like you know something. And so why don't you go investigate that for us? So, I mean, how great is that, that this organization, you know, took a chance on me and took a chance on the future. And also, if you go back and look at all of their materials in the year 2023, beautiful. It's a beautifully run organization if you look at it from that information services perspective. Um, but then what ended up happening was the commute into DC. That that was pre, you know, virtual times and all of that good stuff. The commute into DC just became too much from my home in Maryland. So there was this job ad in the Washington Post, in the paper Washington Post. Um, like, you know, you go through the ads. And Casey, you are way too young to understand any of this or know about any of this, but you go through the ads and you circle with a red pen, um, you know, good, interesting, fascinating job. So there was this job and it said, come take an editing test in Linthicum, Maryland. So it was actually Linthicum where our AUA is located, not too far from our office. So I was like, that sounds interesting. So I show up to take this editing test and it was about goodness knows what, something super scientific. I have no idea. So I took this test and I'm like, I have nothing to lose. So who cares? And I do think the thing that I was successful on is I knew to change data is to data are, you know, things like that. Those are the different things that I think got me through. And I turned out to ace this test. It was totally accidental. I had no idea even what I was reading. 
So I started working at Cadmus Journal Services. Um, this was in the year 2000 um, in Linthicum, Maryland. And that was my introduction to scholarly publishing. And I fell in love with it. So back then, again, things were a slower pace. They did have email, though, and they did have the internet. Um, journals were just starting to transition to these online platforms, um, moving a little a bit away from the exclusively print paradigm. But um, they stuck all of us trainees into this almost classroom environment. They kept us there for a great amount of time. I learned medical terminology across the board. You know, I learned that anything that ends in OMA, that means tum- tumor, itis is infection, etc. You know, learned units of measure, anything and everything possibly related to scientific, technical, medical editing. Um, and they also kind of had us in this classroom because they were waiting to see what type of personality we had. So then they identified me as, I, you know, the personality. I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later, that I am. So they hooked me up with this really cool organization called the American Society of Plant Biologists. And then I also worked on the military medicine account. And what we did was we copy edited it and um, we proofed and then we did issue proofs and then we compiled the journals for these organizations. And I did that and I just fell in love with the work. Um, we also, that organization, we worked with the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, gosh, uh, there were clinical... Um, clinical oncology journals we worked with, clinical chemistry journals. So the subject matter was pretty intense and pretty serious and and pretty um, deep, but I learned a lot, had a lot of fun at that organization. They were a great organization. um, And it really taught me the fundamentals because they just don't teach, um, you know, things are so fast paced now. There's not that time to learn like I got to learn back then. So I grew a real passion. What I learned was, you know, if I'm working at the, you know, for the American Society of Plant Biologists, I learned we are helping to feed the world with those journal articles. So I'm not a scientist. I'm not a plant biologist, but I can help plant, plant biologists bring their life's work um, to, to the world. So then what happened, though, is I had my second child and it was just a lot to keep that full-time job. So I started my own, I left Cadmus, but I continued my connection with them and I had my own business and I did the same sort of work I had been doing. And I was a freelance um, copy editor for every subject matter you could ever imagine. Obesity research, um, pharmacological um, studies, um, hematology studies. I kept up with my plant biology uh, people. You name it, any kind of things. Um, I edited books. I edited one book on death and dying, you know, edited books on hobbies. It could really be any topic. So I don't know if I could do that work now because my, I don't think my brain could switch back and forth like it used to when it was a young brain, but it was so interesting to learn so much and also to have my own business and to learn how to, um, you know, how to make all of that work. It was, you know, as, you, as, as having your own business, I'm sure, you know, seven days a week, you know, you're, you're on call. Yeah. I, I mean, I love having you on a show about associations because that you just nailed the essence of someone who is an associations professional and intentionally wants to stay in this field, which I do, which you do. And it's all about switching hats and and learning about a different industry or a different, you know, completely different association for a different trade. And it's that's to me what keeps me interested in loving that kind of work is being able to learn as a curious person by nature all about those dip, like really dive into that different trade or that different industry. Is that something similar that appealed to you? Oh, it totally time? appealed to me. And I guess I should have mentioned that, that, you know, makes me um, realize what I did love about it. So all of those journals that I was working for and doing that work for, they all had different societies and associations behind them, backing them. So then I had access to how all of these organizations work. So at this point in my career, you know, if you fast forward to now, I have friends all over the association and society world. I know how all they all differently work. I also have resources I can reach out to. And also it's fascinating too, because when you work for any of these organizations, yes, you do, you have to be ready to wear a million different hats. You have to really be prepared to, um, you know, that's what I work in now is publications, but 
I am not too good and I better not be too good to step in and help with something else. That's what I, I love about it. It's never boring. If you're bored at an association, then you are doing it wrong. So I moved from that business uh, scenario where I had my own business. But what I was seeing, though, and where my concern came is, and this is something I think that would be great to talk about today, too, is I do think it's my personal responsibility to keep my, myself relevant. Um, because if I'm not relevant, my organization is not relevant. So as I was I'm always thinking about the pursuit of my own, you know, scholarly publishing relevance, if you, if you will. I've even, I've written an article about this. I've really focused on this intently. And so what I was seeing with this copy editing work that I was doing is that I was starting to lose little bits and pieces of work here and there. And it wasn't because of Jennifer Regala's performance. It was because, and also it was hard for me to scale the work and take other people on. Um, but what I was seeing is a lot of this work was starting to move to um, vendors in other countries where the work could be done a lot, um, you know, it a lot cheaper, just to be honest, and a lot more quickly. And there were huge teams, you know, teams in India, in um, the Philippines, you know, and these folks were doing a magnificent job for a fraction of what I was charging. And I just couldn't charge that fraction. So I got out before, um, before I lost too much of my work, I could just see it coming. And it turns out I was right, thank goodness. Um, so I went back and worked for a publishing company called Start Myth Journal Services. And again, um, I found myself, my uh, favorite client, the American Society of Plant Biologists had moved over to Dirt Myth Journal Services. So, you know, that taught me an important lesson. Be nice to everybody. Always don't burn any bridges ever. Um, whatever you think about any situation, that's, you know, I know you have Kathy Shanley on your show before. Dear friend of mine, I know dear friend of yours. But, you know, that's something that she and I talk about a lot, too. Don't burn any bridges. Um, Keep those relationships strong. I know that's what you did when you left the AUA and you're in contact with all of us. That's a huge key thing with um, association work and really anything that you're doing in your life. So um, there were a number of accounts that had moved over to Dartmouth Journal Services. And I started there as a production editor, but I was working full time. This is way before COVID. It was the year 2009 when I started I worked full-time remotely from my home in Maryland, but the company was in Vermont. Um, And I worked there for many years. Gosh, must have been 10 years. I only spent 17 physical days in that office the entire time. And what a cool company to take a chance and to have this remote workforce. Um, And when I was working there, though, a job came up called Publishing Services Group Leader. So it was this pretty high um, managerial role. And I said, I'm going to apply for that. And they said, no, I'm so sorry. You can't. And it's not because of you, but it's because you're remote. And I'm like, look, give me a chance. Put me through the interview process. Put me through the same you know, hoops that you're doing with any other candidates that you're hiring. Just give me a chance. And they did. Um, so that's my big piece of takeaway advice here. Just because a rule exists, ask if, ask if you can help to break it. You know, it was back to that same thing that I was saying about not having email or the internet at the Fertilizer Institute, you know, be respectful, be p- p- polite, but ask why you can't break that rule. They gave me the chance and I ended up becoming um, a publishing services group leader. So I supervised up to 25 people at any given time, had a myriad amount of accounts. I mean, it was wild. I could be in that in that purview, 50, 75 journals might be in there. So think about the breadth of associations and societies that I was touching at that point. It was, it was significant. Um, it was a huge, tremendous experience. I will say though, in all of that, that was a lot, a lot of work. It was managing a lot of people. I believe that I excelled in it. I, I loved the work. I loved the people, but I did get to a level of burnout in that. Um, you know, it, it was managing a lot of people. It was managing a lot of journals and it was managing a lot of accounts. So I took a tiny little detour. My husband is a real estate agent. Um, I had my real estate license. I didn't become an agent with him. I went and worked in real estate management for the Coldwell Banker Corporation. I did that for a year. I was good at it. I, what my job was to recruit agents, train them and retain them. But 
it turned out to be, I just didn't love it. I missed my publishing. I missed the associations. I missed that world. It gave me though a really great outsider, you know, experience. It, it gave me a year off, even though I was working a tremendous amount of hours. I did have a year off from associations, publications, all of that good stuff to realize, okay, I belong in that world. I need to stay in that world, but maybe I need to look at it from a different angle. And then that's when I went to go work for my beloved American Society of Plant Biologists. Um, so that customer that I've mentioned now for several years, and I had a relationship with them since the year 2000 when I started at Cadmus, I finally got to go work with them as a managing editor. Um, and we self-published two journals, and then we co-published a third open access journal. And so when I say we self-published, that was a huge experience because you don't have like a Walter's Kluwer or an Elsevier or something else like that. You're in charge of that publication show. You're selling the subscriptions. You're, you're managing the editorial manager relationship. You're managing all of the pieces of those journals. And my boss, um, I will mention her by name because I'm going to make her listen to this, uh, was Nancy Winchester was her name. And she was a tremendous, she ended up being the mentor. I never knew I needed and I never had had. Um, I was later in life to get this mentor. So I knew what it meant to have one. And she turned out to be a tremendous influence on my life. So essentially, I had some crazy and wild and fun ideas around social media, around you know, pushing out content around content collections, et cetera. And she didn't have like that whole, you know, that experience, but she was like, go for it, go for it. And she really, you know, gave me wings to, to do what I needed to do. But then came COVID and probably I'd still be working at the American Society of Plant Biologists today if it weren't for COVID, but just due to you know, the publish the scholarly publishing world changing and, you know, just different reasons. And all I, I honestly, I really point to COVID as this reason. Um, I was ready for a change. So I'm sitting there on a weekend and this one sole job comes into my inbox at this place called the American Urological Association. And I'm glad that you pointed out that's urological with a U because a lot of people are like, oh, you work with brains. And I'm like, no, no, not the brains. Um, and I just decided on a whim and it was COVID. And, you know, we were all just like thinking some kind of way during COVID. I just sent my resume off for that. And the rest is history. That's how I ended up at the AUA. Um, and I have to say from the minute that I started at the AUA. Um, that's when I met you, Casey. Um, we worked in the same division. Um, I became the director of publications and the executive editor. And that was something else, starting a job during a pandemic. But it was also the most tremendously wonderful experience. I wouldn't change anything about it. I feel like the AUA, um, they, the, it, this was June 2020. So they had only been in this three months, like any of the rest of us. And they had it, they had their act together. Um, they had me training that was perfect. They had me a setup that was perfect. I'll never forget that. Um, I went and, uh, knocked on the door of the dark AUA building, which is a beautiful building for anyone who hasn't seen it, but I couldn't believe I was meeting a man I had never met. It was, it was JB, um, from our IS department who was fully masked in a dark building that I had never been into before, um, to sit at a table six feet away. I don't know. It was just all so odd. And, uh, you know, uh, it was very, um, science fiction and strange. If you told me that I would be doing that a year before, I would have thought you were nuts. Um, got all set up and, um, you know, that's where I need to mention another name, um, Patricia Banks, um, who you know very well, but she spent, she invested so much time, so much energy. Um, I felt like I got to know all the corners of her house because it was, um, it was COVID times. She sat down, she made sure I was comfortable in the role, comfortable with her which is leadership um, right there. Um, also very comfortable with the fact that she supported me and she had selected me for this role because she heard my ideas and she embraced them. And that within reason, um, 
because I have some, I do have some wild ideas. I have to say that. I would say Patricia probably supports about 90% of them, which is high. If you know me, that's a high number. Um, so, you know, we took it from there. Um, and we have, you know, really impactful publications. Um, and, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about the work that we've done since I've been here, but. I, I, I want to jump in and recap some stuff there because it's so important that our listeners kind of don't brush off a lot of the, a lot of the key elements there of success. I think that was just a masterclass on how professional development, you know, should be done as an association professional, but honestly, in any field. And I just want to recap some of what you just said. That was huge. Um, first of all, networking is, that is huge. And, and all of you, what you just said and, Burning, not burning bridges is obviously so important, but it is a lot of authentic kind of relationship building too, because it's like the people that I stay in touch with that I worked with at the AUA, for example, are people that I would just want to stay in touch with anyways. And I think that's the benefit of working in such a large organization as, as the AUA, because there are so many people there that you're going to meet people that you click with. And I'll take that one step further and I'll say the networking with the members of the association is also another big deal thing because, I mean, as an association with say, you know, say you have 10,000 members, you're working with a lot of those people on, on the day to day if you're staff and there are people that you're going to click with as well that are members. And so I kept in touch with a lot of the members of the association and I still have dear friendships with them. And, you know, of course I'll ask them professional development type things. So it's huge networking to keep in touch with the staff at the association you're working with. And then also some of those members that you're going to click with as well, because it's just natural. You're going to form relationships there too. That you work with them so much. Um, COVID, obviously having to pivot during COVID, scary, scary time. Uh, you know, I can't say enough about how amazing having a, an organization that was kind of, you know, you can never fully be prepared for what happened from just a, you know, financial standpoint, all the awful health, um, stuff aside, just from a financial, um, perspective, like running an industry or running an organization, like you can't really, fully prepared for that. But I think um, the AUA was prepared to at least, you know, be ready for a disaster situation. And and ergo, that's how they were able to even hire during the, the worst of this situation and know that, you know, they were going to be okay because they had done a lot of pr preparation work. Um, you know, pivoting and, and into different things is huge in your story. I think, you know, when you went in your own business and you saw the writing was on the wall of why it wasn't going to be sustainable, you pivoted again. It wasn't easy to pivot into your own business, but you got a huge perspective on what it was like to run your own business. And then kind of you saw the writing on the wall and pivoted back into working for an association. Um, and then, you know, persistence, I think is another key part of your story. When you were talking about how they were saying, Hey, we can't really hire someone who's remote for this pos position. You challenged that and you said, No, I really think I'm the bright person for that. And, the, and here's why. I mean, I think that's huge because I think personally, I might just be like, Oh, well, that's just the way it is. And I'm not going to, but you really pursued that. And I really think that's important to take away from your story too. And then the last thing I'm going to point out, and I'm going to turn the mic back to you is learning about yourself through, through those pivots, right? So like you, you kind of knew the status quo of what it was like working in an association or working for a company. And then you got a perspective on what it was like to run your own show. And, you know, you could kind of see, okay, I, I like this aspect of working for an association or working for a, a salary position. And this is, you know, so you kind of could weigh those pros and cons. And I think that's so important and so hard to do because you're really putting yourself out there. You're taking risks. You're changing what, you know, what you knew as, you know, familiar and comfortable. And so I just can't say enough about how amazing, you know, that story is. And there's so many things that I'll have to go back and listen to because I know there was 
um, pieces on mentorship that are important to take away. So, I mean, this is why I wanted you to come on the show. Um, but now I want to talk about something you didn't mention in, in that um, storytelling. And that was, and this is social media. I mean, you're huge on social media. You're all about developing your own brand. You're all about, you know, putting yourself out there. And, you know, sometimes it's not always the most comfortable thing to do. But I think in 2023, especially if you're trying to kind of build your own personal brand, which is so important, um, you know, I've talked to people that the first thing when they go to hire someone, they're looking, I mean, this was not, this was not full disclosure in association, but this was, um, a friend of mine who runs a physical therapy clinic. He said the first thing he looks for when he goes to hire a new PT is their social media presence. He goes right on their Instagram and sees, are they on social showing off the exercises that they're going to be teaching, you know, the patients, et cetera. So I want to ask you about. When did you start doing social media? What are all the platforms you're on? And what can you tell the people that kind of want to do the same thing? Okay, well, I'll start with what I don't do. I don't do Facebook. I don't love Facebook. I've never done Facebook. Facebook is just not my, uh, it's just not my jam. I, that's, I think, a little too, I don't like that it's a little negative. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm a positive person. So I like to focus. I I don't mind seeing your highlight reel. I don't mind seeing the best, your vacation um, your really nice car, your baby, uh, your pets, like show me that stuff. I do not what I, and I just don't love Facebook and how it's like, oh my gosh, I had to, I, that's just me. That's just me. It's a personal thing. So I'll start there by saying that. So nobody go look me up there because you're not going to find me, but I do, um, I do love Twitter. That's where I started, but I actually did not start. I have, um, feel free to follow me. Jennifer A. Regala is my Twitter handle, but I had a different Twitter handle many years ago and it was a mommy oriented one. And what happened is, um, I have four kids in, uh, in all of this story, you know, I have a wonderful husband and four wonderful kids, but my youngest child who is now 13 and thriving and doing great, doing great. Um, he was sick when he was little. So I got onto Twitter um, to just find a community. And I found this mommy community of wonderful women who, you know, if I was up all night, I had to feed him every two hours around the clock. It was just a group to keep me company. And I couldn't be going out and about and running around with other moms and, you know, living a normal lifestyle. And I was working still in all of that. So I need it. I'm a person that needs community and needs engagement. And it just was a very meaningful way to connect. Those women ended up migrating over largely to Instagram. And to this day, if you look at my Instagram and Casey, you and I follow each other there. So if you see certain women commenting um, on there, that's a lot of those Twitter women from that I still haven't met in real life. But how amazing is it to have that community and they're still supporting? Um, you know, there was a woman who commented the other day. I put a picture of the baby who's doing great now. He's going into eighth grade, how he's going into eighth grade. And people are commenting, oh, my gosh, I remember when he, you know, was going into kindergarten, et cetera. So how wild is that? So these people have been there for that journey. But that taught me a lesson, though, that, community, engagement, and building. So when I got to the American Society of Plant Biologists, I noticed that um, that Twitter was super important to telling the story of our journals. But then I also noticed that there was all of these people like me who were working at these associations and societies. They were out there, though, as themselves. And so it was this, you know, intricate, you have to really be careful when you're doing this, though, because you have to be professional, but you have to be yourself. You have to be careful what you're sharing, but also you want to share enough so people get an idea. You have to be comfortable with doing this. Um, so I was kind of watching for a little bit. And so in 2018 is when I, you know, started going on Twitter in my professional capacity. And that's where I started to really, um, have a lot of fun with what I'm doing. And, um, 
So of course, the where I was working at the time, we had all of our journal handles to promote the journal content. But I saw the opportunity for me to then advance this content and to start having conversations with other scholarly publishing professionals and to have conversations with our authors and with our editors. And so now if you notice in my Twitter today, I'm still connected what you were saying. I remain connected with all my plant biology friends, with my old editors. Um, and I think the most impactful thing I ever saw happen out of these connections that organically and fluidly get made is that a plant biologist came on during my tenure with the AUA and said, hey, I just wanted to tweet out here that because of Jennifer Regala's new urology friends, I finally did what I should have done a long time ago and went and invested in my urological health and got testing done and got some solutions made. And he made this announcement totally unsolicited and unasked for. And how impactful is that? I mean, super, super cool. That's a story that I just love because again, you know, you, you get these connections that you don't really even know where they came from, but they're important. Um, and the other thing too, that I didn't talk about in telling my story is that you need to find your own association, community, professional community. So I am a proud member of the Society for Scholarly Publishing and the, uh, the Council of Science Editors. I do a lot of work with those two organizations myself as a volunteer, um, you know, and I also have taken what I've learned from our wonderful AUA members. And I try really hard to emulate their behavior when I am working with the staff of those organizations um, to have, you know, realistic expectations and so forth. But the connections with all of the community that I have were strengthened on social media as well. So at this point, people know my favorite color is pink. I talk about that a lot on there. That is, I, and it grows. My, my pink, my power pink passion grows exponentially by the day. I just can't help it. I don't even it just, I've always loved pink since I was little, but it's, it's spiral. Um, but also I have made just a lot of publishing friends that I never would have made. I've also connected with a lot of urologists I never would have necessarily connected with. And I'll tell you what anecdotally, it makes a difference. Um, you know, if you have an author who is not pleased with their publishing um, experience, these folks, they will reach out to me with their critical feedback, but they're super nice about it. And they're like, okay, can we talk about this? And we will have really meaningful conversations that result in good change for the journals and a great outcome for that person who might have started out not, you know, so happy. So that was my long-winded response. Um, you know, definitely the the professional thing needs to be remembered, but the fun needs to be remembered. And, you know, being able to connect those things and being comfortable with that, I think, has, has been the key to, I don't think success is the word, but to engagement, the key to engagement. I I couldn't agree more with that. And there's there's so much more I, I want to ask you, so I'm gonna just pause it here, and I'm gonna say look for a Jennifer Regal part two coming down the line because we we there's so many things I want to dive into, especially given so many association professionals who listen to this show are probably curious about the future of publications, and that's something that I want to talk to you more about because you're someone that really um, is living and breathing this stuff every day and you're obviously given your story you're not afraid to change and pivot and move with the times and keep up with that so please listeners to this show stay tuned because i know that there's going to be a follow-up interview with jennifer regala she's the director of publications and executive editor with the american urological association out there in linthicum maryland jennifer as we wrap up i always like to ask guests in their network who might be a fantastic resource for us to reach out to next. You mentioned Kathy Shanley earlier in the show. She is who recommended you and she is fantastic. And we got a chance to, you know, without her putting your name forward, you know, we wouldn't have had this amazing show. So is there anyone that you, um, you think I, we might want to reach out to you here at Six Degrees of Associations and talk so to you next? I have three suggestions for you. Two are AUA. Um, and so, of course, Patricia okay. Banks, I mentioned her. Um, Dana Hamer, yep. who you know well and is oh, a yeah. dear AUA friend of mine. And 
I didn't even say anything about some of my colleagues at the AUA, but she's phenomenal, as you know. Um, and then I have a friend from the American Society of Plant Biologists. She lives in Scotland, and she is the most tremendously connected person I have ever seen. Her name is Mary Williams. She has a PhD in plant biology. Um, she is a features editor um, for the high impact journal, The Plant Cell, but she does so much more than that. Um, she has a National Science Foundation um, grant. Um, it's a $5 million grant right now um, where she's working on something called Shoots and Roots, and it's building DEI initiatives within the, uh, within the plant biology community. I can't even begin to explain what she does, and she's phenomenal, and you would love her. You would love her. She would be a really great... And then that would be interesting because she's with an association, but it would kind of take your... Uh, it might take your recommendations, branch off. I'm saying branch because of plants. It oh, might yeah. branch you off into um, <laughs> other directions. That I mean, that's amazing. And also the fact that she's in Scotland is going to add a new international perspective to our show. And I am super excited to meet Mary Williams. Thank goodness for the power of technology and, and all these remote podcasting platforms because it really is just opening up so many different doors. Um, and... Again, Jennifer Regala has been our guest today on Six Degrees of Associations. Jennifer, I'm going to give you the final word. Is there anything else you wanted to mention before we wrap okay, it up? Okay, I'll just leave with my personal motto, which is it's free to be nice and to comb your hair. So just be nice to everybody. You're going to be very successful if you are. I love it. It's so true. It doesn't cost any money to be nice to people and, you know... It's, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it, it feels good too to be nice to folks. So thank you again, Jennifer. You're certainly someone that practices what they preach as they say.